For in spirit, for they shall, theirs is the kingdom of that. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And today, blessed are the meek, for they shall, or the merciful, sorry, for they shall obtain mercy. <coughs> the psalmist is communicating about a couple of different things that he is requesting from the Lord. One being the removal of the consequences of his iniquity. Second, that God's goodness would be poured out upon him. And regularly the psalmist requests these things, and hopefully in our own prayers we request these things, both for our sins to be purged and removed from us and help in keeping them away, but also in requesting for that which the Lord has offered us, the help in times of need. If we go to, for instance, Matthew chapter 6, and we were to look at this incredible example prayer that Jesus gives, where he asks for daily bread, that God would take care of his people, both physically, that he would lead them not into temptation, verse 13. But on the condition, verse 12, that we forgive our debts as, uh, that he would forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I find it interesting, additionally, in, in verse 14, there in Matthew chapter 6, that Jesus goes on to explain this prayer. I've mentioned this a couple of times now. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's almost as if this concept of forgiveness was foreign, or at least uh, misunderstood by the Israelites that Jesus is speaking to. Because this is the only element that they need to be uh, corrected on, or this that needs a little bit more e explanation. The other aspects, asking God for what they need, the, the Jews were pretty good about that, were begging God for that which they could not provide themselves. They were good at praising God with loud and audacious ways oftentimes. But they weren't always good at forgiveness, at being merciful. Mercy is really used in two different ways here in the New Testament. If you move forward to Matthew chapter 15. In Matthew chapter 15, if you notice in verse 22, there is a woman who begs for mercy. In verse 22 he says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Now Jesus initially says no, and look at the response of his disciples. Send her away. Get her away from us. She's bothering us. She's getting in the way. And he answered and he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which implies that she's a Gentile. I wasn't intended on doing things like this for people that weren't part of Israel. Now, you have to read it all the way to the end to understand what's happening. In verse 25, then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And look at her response. Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And she says, sure, I'll be the little dog at the table. I'll accept that role, that place, if it means that I get that which I desperately need, the healing of my daughter. And then look at Jesus' response in verse 28 after he has, to some degree, told her to go away, chastised her a bit. And look at the resolve she has, and look at the reward Jesus gives her for that resolve. And Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you have, uh, to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This person who Jesus even admits wasn't initially the people he was intended to go to. This Gentile woman. And yet her faith resounded in his heart. And he had compassion on her. He had mercy on her. And that's the idea. Compassion on the unfortunate. If we notice it. For instance, in James chapter 1 and verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, 
to visit the fatherless and the widows and their afflictions, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Those two elements, to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. And these are not individuals who have injured themselves in any way, who have caused their own distress or the difficulties of life that they're sustained. They are individuals who were born. And something has happened to their parents that they are now orphans. Or individuals who have lost their spouse through no fault of their own. These are not people who have made poor decisions, and yet they need assistance. These are the unfortunate. These are the individuals who desperately need compassion. And these are the individuals that James tells us, guided by the Holy Spirit, who deserve compassion who need that compassion, and we need to extend it to them. We see something similar there in Matthew 17 and verse 15, but we're going to go to, to Matthew 18. In Matthew chapter 18 and, and verse 35, the culmination of this parable of the unforgiving servant, of this servant who owed his master this insane debt, this ridiculously large debt, so large that it's impractical for Jesus to even use these kind of numbers. And yet he's making a point that anyone who heard this would go, well, that's just ridiculous. How does someone accumulate that much debt? And, and that's his point exactly. And yet that's a very good illustration of our debt to God. And yet his master, when he begs his master to forgive him or give him time more precisely, he forgives that man his debt. And that same man goes to his fellow servant who owed him a relatively small amount of money. Something that would have been, yes, difficult, but entirely possible that he would have repaid it as he promises. And instead of having compassion on him, or even giving him time to pay it, he has him thrown into the jail. He has him beaten, or at least wants to have him beaten. And when his master finds out, his master is very angry with him. Because he had forgiven him this incredible debt, and this servant was unwilling to forgive anything, was unwilling to extend the same concern for another. And he says there in verse 33, the culmination, Jesus still talking from the parable, should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the, tor to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. And then 35, Jesus removes himself from this parable. He's no longer talking in the parable. And he's looking, I imagine, at his audience. And they are enthralled, enamored by his message. Because they understand entirely what's going on. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forget his brother, his trespasses. There's a word that Jesus uses there in verse 33. I had pity on you. And the word pity just means to, to feel bad about a bad situation another is in. But it can lead to being merciful. But it doesn't intrinsically mean, though Jesus, in this case, is talking from a master who felt pity. And that pity moved him to do something. To be compassionate on someone who was unfortunate. To help. Recently, we've had a... A series of protests, basically, that have been going on in schools. They call it the school walkout. And there have been a number of counter-protests, essentially, made where they have uh, argued that instead of a school walkout, we should have a school walk-up. Which is to say that students who see people who are alone, who are isolated, who are ostracized from the group, should walk up to them and try to be their friend. To communicate that they are not alone. To sit with people they wouldn't normally sit with. Basically, the argument is we should be decent human beings. To be compassionate on others. Because somewhere along the line, other people have been compassionate to us. And rather than protest, which is always a very easy thing to do, we should take ourselves out of a, of a secure and a, an easy situation and do what is sometimes very difficult. And we should do it not just in schools, we should do it in our lives. We should do it and take opportunity to, to be compassionate on those, even in awkward situations, in difficult situations, even when things are not going terribly well. 
The second element here, as he talks about, is the sparing of punishment. This individual needed to be compassionate to forego the punishment on these individuals. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it's obvious that we have been spared a level of punishment. In, in verses 9 and 10, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now, if you stop right there in verse 9, things seem all hunky-dory. They seem really great. But that doesn't actually get at the heart of the matter, that it wasn't always great. Yeah, Christians are now this royal priesthood, this holy nation, God's special people. And we have an opportunity to praise Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. But that assumption is that we were once not a people, even though now we are the people of God, who previously had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. There is not a Christian alive or dead, who have not received mercy. That's kind of the necessity of being a Christian. That they understood their position in life. They understood that they were poor in spirit. They mourned that poverty. They recognized their place in the world with meekness. And they hungered and thirsted after the righteousness that was from God. And they were filled. They were filled with that righteousness. They were provided that righteousness. And so, we are those who are willing to be merciful. Those who are willing to spare the punishment of others because we have been spared an incredible punishment. And we see this mercy by example. If you notice in Jesus' case, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, when Luke talks to Theophilus and records to him and narrates on all the things that Jesus began both to do and teach. He was not one who simply taught a message of of mercy and compassion, but one who exemplified it. In Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 14, a widow is coming out of the city, and there is a huge contingent of people. The entire city, practically, it says, is coming out behind him, her, sorry, towards Jesus. <coughs> and she is destitute. Her only son is dead. And Jesus has compassion on her, on one who is unfortunate, and he raises her son from the dead. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, headed to the cross, Jesus prays for those who would place him on. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The early church were a great example of compassion. Many, many instances. Obviously, Jesus would as well, but even the early church, they understood the necessity of compassion. In chapters 4 and 5, we see individuals selling their possessions because the body needed support, because people were destitute, were having financial difficulties, were struggling even feeding themselves. And so they sell their possessions, specifically a man named Barnabas, or more precisely, a man given the name Barnabas, because he was a great encourager. But many others did the same, and they moved in one with another. But in Acts 6, we find a difficulty. The Grecian widows, the Hellenistic widows, were not being taken care of as they should have been. And so the church reasons that it is right and good to take care of these individuals and institutes what we perceive to be the first deacons in the body of Christ there in the church in Jerusalem. Seven men chosen who were filled with the Spirit, who were guided by truth, who were good and respectable, and had a reputation of uprightness. And they were selected to take care of that which was very important and needed to be taken care of. In 1 Corinthians 16, and many other places, we read of the brethren who were suffering in Jerusalem, and many around the world, as Paul would travel, Many, he both compelled and they willingly gave of themselves so that they could support the brethren in Jerusalem who were struggling with persecution. That persecution which would extend outward, not only from Jerusalem, but ultimately from Rome, they would experience their own forms of persecution. But for now, the church in Jerusalem was struggling. And they, being the original, the 
original instigators of all of this difficulty and those who were taking the greatest beating from it were supported from all over. That encouragement can mean the world to these, to these Christians in Jerusalem. In Acts 7, in verse 60, though Stephen is being pummeled with stones, though he has preached an excellent gospel sermon and he has not received the same response as the apostles there in Acts 2, or in Acts 3, or in Acts... <laughs> though he doesn't receive the same response as those in the past, Stephen still preaches it. And as the people there, the Jews, gnash their teeth at him, and they come running at him, and they decide that it is appropriate for them to stone this man, he prays that God would not charge them with the sin that they are committing. That he would wish them well, even while they are doing him harm. There are some incredible examples of mercy, both in the compassion on the unfortunate and the sparing from punishment. But there are many things in the scriptures, many things that we experience each and every day that are confused with mercy. Many things that we confuse with this incredible attribute of being merciful. And one of them is a gentleness towards sin. In 1 Corinthians 5, our world today would call the Corinthians tolerant. <laughs> They would say, these Corinthians, they have done a good thing, the world we live in anyway. They would say, they have tolerated, they are very tolerant of this man simply because he is a different lifestyle than they do. He has made different choices. And they would argue the world, the religious world in general, would argue that his, his salvation is secure, that he is in fact still a Christian. And Paul says otherwise. In fact, in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. That's pretty bad. You're doing something even the Gentiles won't do. Wow! That a man has his father's wife. Notice in verse 2, they felt vindicated. They felt tolerant. You are puffed up. And have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. They said, we are merciful that we are overlooking the sin that this guy is in. We are more concerned with his soul than his physical body decisions. Well, the decisions you make with your body or with your mind affect your soul and your salvation. And they were concluding themselves, patting themselves on the back because they were gentleness. They were gentle not just towards the sinner, but more particularly towards the sin. And they would not come down on it. They would not say to this man that it is unacceptable that you live this way. That it's not right for you to do such a thing. And it was a detriment not only to the church there, the leaven that leavens the whole lump, but it was a detriment to their ability to communicate the gospel to the world around them because this man was living in a way that even the Gentiles don't live. Was doing a thing that even the Gentiles, and yet he is associated with the church. We cannot be merciful by leaving someone in sin. That, that's an oxymoron. That's like saying, man, I really hope well for this guy who's still in a burning building. And I'm not doing a thing to help him. That's not mercy. That's complacency. That's being overly worried that he'll get upset that you're telling him that his house is on fire. And as absurd as that sounds, is that not exactly what this world is communicating? Is that not what the religious world is effectively doing? And is that not what we're doing when we refuse to tell someone of the consequences of their sins? Being gentle toward a sinner is a very different thing than being gentle towards sin. In verses 4 and 5, notice he says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, if you stop right there, that would be pretty harsh. And you'd go, well, yeah, I get it. Okay. Because the sanctity of the body of Christ is that important. And yes, you would be right. 
He could have stopped right there and he would have still been right. Because that leaven leavens the whole lump. You can't sacrifice everybody in the congregation because you want to be patient with one person who is actively participating in sin and cares nothing about changing. Not yet, anyway. But he doesn't stop there. He says that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So it's not just for the sanctity of the body of Christ, but it's for his well-being as well, because he is in danger of hellfire. Because he is at risk of an eternity in hell if he continues in this. And so it is not merciful to this man to overlook the sin that is so blatantly being performed. It is not being tolerant outside of the mutilation of the word as it's used today. Yeah, you're tolerating him going to hell. <clears throat> Fantastic. Great job. And so Paul calls them out. And it's not even a situation where this man was unwilling to change because in 2 Corinthians we find what seems to be this same man who has changed. And Paul says you should restore him. You should bring him back in. You should treat him as if he hadn't done it in the first place because that's what mercy is. That's what compassion is. A scarring from punishment. But you don't continue to treat him that way simply because he used to be that way. If that were the case, then God would hold all of our sins against us all the time because we did perform them at one time. We were guilty of them. And how would you like that? How would you like a God that pulled out all the sins that you committed when it suited him? When it came to beating you over the head and getting you to do what he wanted you to do. And yet God doesn't do that. When God relinquishes those sins, he forgets them. He leaves them behind. They are covered in his son's blood. And he has no desire to bring them up once more. We have to continue faithfully in his will and in his word if we want to be blessed. And in order to be blessed, because we want to obtain mercy, we have to be ones who are willing to be merciful. To be compassionate on the unfortunate, to spare those who would normally be punished in relation to us. That you don't hold it against them when people wrong you and they come to you and they say that they are sorry. We talked about a word earlier that Jesus had, or, well, the master in the, in the situation had on that man who had this incredible debt, and the word pity. And the word pity simply means, again, a feeling bad about a bad situation that someone else is in. In James chapter 2, you have such Christians that James is arguing against this attitude that you can simply have pity on someone. That that is simply enough. But I feel really bad. That you are in this situation, this awful situation. In James chapter 2, verse 14, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also by faith, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What does it profit? James says, nothing at all. Nothing at all. John, in 1 John 3, would say, how does the love of God abide in you? If this is the situation that you find yourself in, that you have a brother or sister in Christ who has need of your assistance, you are able to help them, and all you do is say, go your way, be warmed and filled. I wish you well. I feel really bad about your situation. That's pity. Pity's not enough. And sometimes that's all we can muster. Sometimes we just feel bad about the situation. And what do you do? What do you do when that show co or that commercial comes on with the Sarah McLaughlin song and all those animals? All of you know what I'm saying. You change the channel if you don't want to watch it. All of those pathetic animals. And they want you to support the SPCA. ASPCA. I'm not good with acronyms, I guess. But you feel pity on them, and that's what they're playing at. They're tugging on your emotional heartstrings. Now, if you want to support them, fine. But you shouldn't support them because you're emotionally moved in that moment to do so, but because you've made a conscious decision to do something important to you. And all of those kind of commercials. And they're always very good at emotionally driving the point home. 
And this is part of the problem, as we've discussed in the denominational world, with the addition of instrumental music. I was watching there, listening to a video, I was listening to a, an audio of a person preaching this lesson, and he, his point was really incredible, and I won't tell you what it is, because I plan on using his point later. But his point was really incredible, the way he handled it and, and what he was discussing, but like most of the time in the denominational world, it was incredibly emotionally driven, and they even had this ridiculous music behind it. You don't need emotionally driving music to put a point on the crucifixion of Jesus. If you need music to drive you emotionally on biblical topics like the crucifixion of Jesus, then I question your faith and what you understand to be the cause of his crucifixion, <clears throat> our sins. Pity is not enough. It's simply feeling bad about a bad situation that someone else is in. Pity can lead one to action, but it can also simply be avoided or explained away or ignored. You can change the channel. You can avert your eye from making contact with that person holding a sign, someone who claims to be homeless or hungry. And as long as you don't look him in the eye, you won't feel bad. And so you avoid eye contact. And there's all kinds of things that we do. Our culture is filled with people and organizations that play on our pity and our sympathy to get what they want. And the answer to feeling bad and never doing anything is not in doing everything anyone asks. Because that's no answer at all. The answer, rather, is to grow a spine. And to support the things that you ought to support because they're right to support, and to not support the things that you should not support because they're wrong to support. Be able to tell people no. Say no. Or to say yes. But regardless of the situation, we as Christians need to grow a spine. Like the church in Corinth needed to grow a spine. And most of the time you talk to Jesus, the people he's talking to, basically what he's saying is, guys, grow a spine. Grow up. Be able to communicate with normal human beings to do what is decent and good and right and just rather than simply what is easy. And that's a difficult thing to learn. But that's a necessary thing for the church that Jesus built. We, friends, need to grow a spine. Then we quit pretending as well. You ever had a person who told you that they forgive you but then they held a grudge? My goodness, grow up. If you say you forgive someone, then forgive them. Then let it go. Don't use it as a cudgel you pull out every time you want to do them damage or harm to make them feel bad. And you've heard of husbands and wives that do this to one another. But we can do it in the brotherhood just as easily. We can hold grudges and be upset about something for long periods of time. And we have no business doing it. If we're going to forgive people, if we're going to make something right then make it right and let it go. Just as the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians was to let that person back in, was to treat them again as a brother, even though he was doing this unspeakable thing, the thing that even the Gentiles didn't involve themselves in. But when confronted, what did he do? He changed. When the Corinthians were finally encouraged by Paul to grow a spine, what did this guy do? He changed. That's the result of the gospel. That's the power of the compassion and the mercy of Jesus when we offer it to people. We can't offer it at a discount. We can't pretend it's something that it's not. We can't be okay with things that shouldn't be happening. We can't be tolerant in the way that the world would like us to be tolerant. Now, we can tolerate people. I tolerate people all the time. We live in a world where there are people who are doing sinful and awful things. And while I might not want to have regular dealings with them, am I okay sitting on a bus with somebody, or riding an elevator with somebody, or sharing a bathroom with somebody? Sure. Do I tolerate their existence? Obviously, because they're still alive. And if I were to tolerate their existence, they'd have to be dead, because that's what tolerate really means. But that doesn't mean that I have to tell them they're all right. That doesn't mean that I can tell them that they're right with God, the God of heaven and earth. Now, they may have created a God, and they might be right with the God they created, but that's an entirely different thing. We can't confuse mercy with a gentleness towards sin or pity or pretending. We need to be people who are steadfast in the truth. 
But most importantly, we need to help prepare others to meet their God. Because the Word of God cuts to the heart of the matter. It cuts to the even through the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. We're not going to escape His judgment. We're not going to escape with our soul if we're not right with Him. In fact, we are giving it up if we're not right with Him. There will come a day where we will be held accountable for the actions that we take, for the life that we give, and as Jesus describes here, for the mercy that we, are will that we willingly heal to people. For the compassion on the unfortunate and for the sparing of punishment to those who are trying. Are we the merciful people that will be blessed, that can be happy because we can know that the Lord is going to forgive us of our trespasses, of our issues, of our difficulties, of our sin? Will we be ones who obtain mercy? Are we prepared to meet our God? The Lord has been merciful, offering us a means by which we may inherit eternal life. If we will hear his word, Romans 10, 17, believe it with all of our hearts, Acts 8, 37, confess him before men and repent of our sins, Romans 10, verse 10, and be baptized for the remission of those sins, Acts 2, 38, we can become his children. We can become inheritors, ones who possess something which cannot be taken from us. John chapter 1, and verse 12, we can be inheritors of God. <clears throat> Then let us remain in Christ if we are in Him. If we have been washed and redeemed in His blood, baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. Then let us remain in Christ by living faithfully until death, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Because there is coming a day that you will be judged for the decisions you have made in this life. For the life that you have led either in Christ or outside of Christ. And if we can live faithfully unto death, then the crown of righteousness will be ours. Then that place in heaven is secured in His mercy and His grace. If you need to put on Christ today, or you need to walk away from sin that you've been ensnared by, or you need help staying on the right path, we can help you. We can help you through this difficulty, through every difficulty. We can be there for you. We can pray for you. But we can't really help you unless we know... What's going on? Unless you're willing to share what's happening in your life and the struggles you're going through. I pray that we would all be more willing to come to the body of Christ for help. And if today we can help you in any way, I pray that you would let it be known as together we stand and sing.